<laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 195, one nueve cinco, or cinco nueve uno, uno nueve cinco. As you can tell, my Spanish is getting to an absolutely ridiculous level, highest level ever. My Spanish, 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 or not Spanish, but Spanish is getting so good, right, that I'm now deciding to add another language on top of that to kind of give me um, another um, tool in my arsenal of languages. And if you're wondering, I guess, you know, what language will you be learning now? It's French, people. It's French, okay? Um, bonjour. <laughs> Merci. But yeah, how are you doing, people? Welcome back to the show. It's your boy Agostino. I'm back here again in a hot seat somewhere in East London with the sun shining to my right, to your left, wherever it may be. I've just had a nice big breakfast. I'm feeling full. I've had a couple of glasses of coffee. I've got a bottle of water here from the good old um, Highland Spring. They're a sponsor of the podcast. So big up Highland Spring for sponsoring me and giving me bottles of water. That's amazing. Usually um, podcasters, YouTube people get, you know, other more valuable things like maybe trainer deals or maybe they get hair value vitamins or makeup or they get you know um iphone holders or something whatever i get bottles of water from highland spring so if you're feeling dehydrated and you want a bit of fresh water down your esophagus you want to splash yourself in the morning and remind yourself that life isn't an empty vapid pursuit of meaningless items drink yourself some highland springs use the code aggie to claim 10 percent off ding but no, well gone. Hope you guys are doing well and you're all right. I'm feeling fine actually. I got back from the gym, had a good little pump workout today. I was meant to go running, but I thought, you know what? Let me switch it up today. Let me go and work out and go to the gym because I haven't been in the gym in a while. I've been in the gym maybe for like three weeks. I've been running basically every week instead i've not been doing any gym work because i felt usually whenever i try and do gym and running work together my body just completely shuts down so but for you know what i need to push my body i need to tell my body no i decide what you do right and when you do it so i went to the gym today i did some heavy heavy deadlifts i think i got to about two uh 100 kg which is what yes yeah, so about 40 right 40 40 40 40 and the bar is 20 so that's 100, right? What's 100 kg in pounds? Let's see what I did there. Because that's a pretty good run. Then I did some overhead press, some um, some um, overhead presses. Um, and then I did some bench presses as well, which was a very strenuous, actually. I just did a, yeah, so I did 100, let's see, what I did, I did a kg, right? Kg to labs, to elbows. So I did 100 kg on my dumbbell, on my deadlift. So I did about 200 pounds, right? For five, um, for sets of five. Is that what you say? I don't know how you terminology. I lifted it up five times. And I did it five times, right? But I worked. I worked up. So I started. I think off from about. I'm gonna say about sixty kg and worked my way up to when I got to hundred kg. And then on the bench press, I only did. I only really did. Um, what I do? What's what's fifteen? Fifteen. That's thirty. Fifty. So I did fifty kg on a barbell. Uh, for a set of five so i did 110 on the barbell and i only did that for like i don't know for the best part of yeah i just did that basically i didn't go any higher than that and then overhead presses i probably did about 15 um which was about the same isn't it right no I, yeah about 50 so about 50 yeah about the same so um i'm trying to get my bench press and overhead press you know numbers up slowly but surely but it's taking a while to do that today it was harder because i didn't have the rack in order to do my um overhead presses because usually when you have the rack the bar's already up in, a, in yeah it's already up so you got to do is basically lift it up onto your shoulders and then kind of push it up when you're doing it from the ground you kind of like you know cleaning it lift up your shoulders you, so that's already a bit of an action it's already a bit of a workout then you have to push it up over your head it's a little bit hard to do so sometimes you don't necessarily get the requisite work you need to do and, and sometimes because i was lifting up from the floor um without realizing i was cheating a little bit by kind of like bending my knees and pushing up which obviously i'm not going to i want to do them strict and kind of only use my arms uh to kind of push up the barbell but you know say la vie got the workout done and then bench press of course i've never really been my chest has always been one of my weak points my chest my lack of being able to squat air squat and all that stuff my ankles and my hip mobility isn't the best so those are two things i'm sort of working on and i don't know for for being three weeks away from the gym i was fairly um i was still fairly strong um it might have something to do with the fact that i was running quite often that might have helped the actual overall um the ability to maybe keep that hold of that strength but i don't know i was surprised of how strong i was i thought i'd be a lot further behind 
having not done any weight workouts until for i don't know basically until recently until today basically um i've been doing loads of push-ups at home maybe that might have helped i've been trying to do like 100 push-ups a day um I've, I've missed a couple of days here and there but for the most part i've been consistent with that so maybe that's helping i don't really know but yeah um so far so good um again not as full as i expected it to be i think maybe on saturdays and stuff it might get full but i'm not sure if that whole summer bod thing is a myth and people just don't bother anymore now i think maybe because there's so much information out there about working now about what you should do and what you shouldn't do that people have suddenly realized you know what if i haven't got the body i want now it's not going to happen in two weeks so they just completely suck it off which is which is good for me because you know i get more room in the gym but i'm interested to know if that's actually the case because it was really empty surprisingly empty maybe because the time i go i went about half six and maybe no one's up that time because i know whenever i go on a weekend at around 2 p.m or 1 p.m it's absolutely ram jammer with people but you know for in, if you're serious about working out the last thing you want to do is go to gym on a saturday afternoon so maybe that's the case but yeah i'm i'm surprised about how empty it is um in comparison as well with what's around us as well because we've got loads of crossfit gyms and all that sort of stuff and other you know more expensive gyms around so you'd expect somewhere like where i go to that's essentially i think 25 pound no i pay 20 25 and i think the all the basically the um, anytime you want to work out i think the what's it called the anytime workout pass is about 30 they because i've got i've got the pass that only allows me to go before peak time so that's any time from the morning until about four and then i think the, the pass that lets you go whenever you want is about 30 quid which is you know peanuts considering you, I think you use it. I think that, that includes a swimming pool too. So if you want, you can include swimming, which most gyms always charge a premium for. So again, maybe people are cottoning onto the fact that you know if you're not got the summer body you want now, then it's over. Or maybe people in my area just don't give a shit. I don't know. Wherever it is, I'm not complaining. Apart from that, whilst I've been on, mm, I've seen some fairly motivating things on you on on the old Twitter space. You know. Um, I was listening to a really good podcast actually today, this morning, um, with um, a guy called Christopher Ryan. Um, the podcast is called Tangentially Speaking and it speaks to a guy called Charles Einstein. I'm not sure if he's any relation to the famous Albert Einstein, but it's a really interesting podcast because he basically touches quite briefly on, um, no, it's not, it's not Charles Einstein. It's actually another podcast. It's the one with, uh, Aubrey Marcus. It's, it's with a guy called Mark ha Manson. And the podcast is number 205 and it's called The Problem of Hope. And it's a really good podcast because it touches really briefly on the concept of depression, right? It's just something along the lines of um, depression isn't feeling sad. Depression is hopelessness, right? The feeling that, you know, there's nothing that you can do that can change your mood, that's going to affect your future, that's going to make things better. It's that kind of like extreme hopelessness. And it touched a nerve with me because obviously over the last few weeks and stuff, I've been feeling a little bit hopeless, right? When it comes to just my life and what I've been doing in general and my journey so far and, you know, bouncing around from job to job and stuff and kind of feeling as if like maybe the bounce around from job to job and, you know, the, the last couple of jobs haven't really been my fault, right? They've been kind of outside of my control. The fact that the companies have kind of gone under and the fact that they were run by absolute stupid, inept, brain dead, um, I don't know, you know, an absolute sorry excuse for entrepreneurs. But some of the things that led me to those positions are completely my fault. And I take extreme, where's the book here? So I can see it. I take extreme ownership of the situation, right? It's completely my fault in that regard. I take extreme ownership of it that I probably have put myself in a position where I was trying to get, I was trying to get jobs that allowed me more, more, what's that thing called? Ownership, right? Uh, that would essentially, if you get a job that requires, that lets you have more ownership, the understanding is that you get more management experience and management experience means you get more of a salary. And salary means that your career prospects kind of um, uh, broaden. But obviously, you know, as you guys have known, I've not really been, uh, my ambition has never been to kind of be, work my way up a company and, and become like general manager or become a CEO or CTFO or managing partner, wherever it may be. My ambition is always kind of to do my own thing, whether it's this, whether it's DJing, whether it's writing, whether it's photography, whether it's commentary, whatever it may be, just like whatever this is, this is my overall ambition. So I guess when you have those goals in your head, you can sometimes get a bit, you can sometimes get a bit um, erratic and you can sometimes not think, think, think through things. You can sometimes not think things through clearly. And now I'm in a space where I'm thinking through, I'm thinking things through, I'm thinking things through clearly. Why, why does that take so hard to say? I don't know why. Why, why is that so hard to say for me? Anyway, now I'm thinking things through clearly and I'm really like, you know, mellowed out. 
And also I have like a clear goal in mind where, you know, the stuff that I'm doing at work is feeding into stuff that I'm doing here. So all the money that I'm making from work is feeding into this and it's feeding into my DJing, whatever it may be. And I'm, I'm kind of lasered into what I want to do. That's made things easier. But I think in the beginning when I wasn't, I was basically trying to look for things that were going to inspire me, motivate me and get my dreams going through work. And of course, you know, that's a recipe for disaster, right? It's sort of like looking for love and relationships and stuff. That's not going to happen, right? Or looking for a particular kind of love and relationship, right? You can only They can only give you what they can offer. And you have to kind of, you know, be happy with that. Um, same with the job, right? They can only give you what they have, right? And if it's a mess, if it's a bit of bullshit and you're not liking it, it's less about the company, more so about you. So now I guess I'm in a place where I'm like, you know, sort of come complaining, oh, this place is rubbish. Uh. It's like, no, 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 the place isn't rubbish because there's, you know, 30, 30 plus people working there who are more than happy to work there and have a good time. It's you that's the actual problem about it. You don't like where you're working. So that's fine. No problem. I don't like where I'm working. Um, But you have to make the change that way. But, you know, over time, you can sometimes get a little bit, it's hard to motivate yourself. You get a bit down. So I, I think that was, that's what I was feeling going on what this guy, um, uh, Mark Manson said on the Aubrey Marcus podcast, episode number 205, I was feeling hopeless. And that was kind of maybe the hint of depression I had. But then obviously over time, you know, you kind of get over it and you kind of put, see the wood for the trees. And I basically just realized, you know, the only way I'm going to change this, the only way I'm going to be able to affect my mood is if I do something about it, is if I make some changes. And I kind of go back to how I was previously, right? A few years ago where I was like on my fucking, you know, head down journey and really kind of chasing things. I was waking up really early and work, working out. I was reading a lot of books. Like now I've, I've still got a couple of books I haven't read this month that I need to really finish before I buy some new ones. I was um, not going out as much. And if I was going out, it was for a specific purpose. I was going to see someone play and I was coming straight back home. I had a really lasered in focus on what I was doing. And I don't want to, and I want to go back to that kind of person I was previously. And that's what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to just kind of reduce the stress, go back to what I was doing and get, and get back to that um, lane. But I've seen some things on Twitter basically that have kind of led me back to that inspiring um motivated kind of sense of self and this one video is what i wanted to show you um of this video of this dude 70 year old man who's effectively running a two uh an under three hour marathon which is insane right i think he's 70 something it's fucking insane i just see his video quick i just see this video just now on uh, on the older uh, twitter space i absolutely love twitter i'm not sure why i haven't been on twitter before um i've kind of i've kind of diverted all my attention off of instagram and on twitter but i love twitter man it's, it's super cool you get some good um little you know you get you get cool funny little videos you get some interesting articles that you can read it's actually quite informative obviously i i think i'm lucky because i haven't really followed toxic or problematic people who are constantly you know fighting people online and shit so it's been pretty all right for me but I quite enjoyed the experience obviously of using twitter for the most part i've not really had a any bad experiences so far famous last words but hopefully it continues anyway this is a video from um runner's world i'm going to quickly put up here on the screen so you guys can see and then we'll talk about it a little bit you guys playing boom 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 so this video here this dude is 70 years old and ran a two two hour five and a three hour marathon which is an insane goal to have but let's look at a bit of it now i'm having a blast running every day's a new adventure wow gene dykes has been running for six decades <laughs> fucking hell Races a year. Wow. And, uh, close to 3,000, including training. Wow. Last year I did 43 races in 40 weekends. Wow. Actually, I told my wife when I retired, I, you know, I'm not going to run all the time. I already run as much as I could. That's amazing. So he retired and then just, uh, and basically ramped up his running when he's got more time on his hands. People, that's why, that's something I've always admired, actually. Like, um, you know, older, older people who kind of retire and instead of just sit. Because I, I guess. It must be difficult because he said he's been running for six decades. So I imagine he's been a career athlete most of his life, right? So he doesn't really know anything else but but running. So um, it's maybe um, it's not as much of a strain on his mind as it is most people. But there is something take away the running. There is something about um, there is something about retirement that sort of changed over the years. I remember you know when we were younger or just in general society, maybe retirement was this idea of going over to Turks and Caicos or the Caribbean or, you know, somewhere in Mexico, wherever it may be, and just like lounging on a lounge chair somewhere, smoking a cigar and chilling out. That's one vision of it, which doesn't sound too bad. But I guess the other side of it as well is the idea of like doing the things that you actually enjoy all the time, like, you know, more or just like cranking up the time, uh, cranking up the, the stuff that you enjoy, like time-wise, and then leaving the other stuff that you don't enjoy to the side. That's what I'd want to do in retirement, right? You've got loads of time on your hands. You've made the money. Your kids are all grown up now, moved out, and living their life. What, what, what? Why wouldn't you do that, right? There's no point. Um, what's the point in living if you're just going to sit around 
until the day that you kind of leave this earth you might as well kind of go out on a bang that's what i would imagine and this is just a really good way to go out running fucking a thousand miles every race like shit i was so wrong he averages 40 to 45 to 60 miles a week which is much more than i average i average what at the moment because i'm running quite often so it's a bit different but i think before when i was it's basically it's hard for me to do it though because i don't necessarily run yeah i can't really say because i don't necessarily run conventional running programs my running program really is about um building up strength and cardio vascular endurance it's a different model of running it's not about putting in miles it's more so just about uh being an efficient runner but that being said because i'm making up mad excuses <laughs> um the last week can you show why can't i just show weeks that's the annoying thing about this run thing and it just shows months but anyway, let's say I've not got for the whole month of April. I ran twenty three miles anyway, so it's not even close to anything that he ran. And then February was seventeen, uh, January was twenty seven. So yeah, it's not even anything close to what he ran already. Wow, so I'm really running a lot more this month because I've got those big runs in, isn't it? So I did. Yeah, he's 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 already smashing me. Some people are surprised that it's so much, and some people are surprised that I run so little each week. Of course, a month ago, I, I hit a 230-mile week. Wow. That was all in just one race. Wow. Yeah, Dyke loves the competitive side of the racing. And I guess I love that too. I guess that's the only thing that really gives you a goal. I knew, and there was a time, I think I mentioned it quite often to my friends. There was a time when I was training quite often, when I was like really at my peak condition, which I'm trying to get back to now. At the moment, I'm about 223 um, pounds, which is good. I'm really happy. I've lost about eight pounds over the time. So I'm, I'm, on, I'm on course to, to hit under 220 by next week which would be fucking heavenly because whenever i hit under 220 that's when you can really see the 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 kind of um weight loss already i can see it kind of in my face here i can really feel my cheekbones but from 220 underneath i'm going to start feeling real big differences and obviously my times will kind of speed up but when i was really on my peak and i think i was down to about i don't know let's say 15 stone right is that about 15 stone let me go in my unit measure and just double check i think it was 15 stone so let's say i was um let's say i was 186 right where's that in stone yeah about oh fucking hell i was 13 stone now i'm what 15 so yeah i've got about two two stones left to lose but yeah when i was 13 stone i was running often i remember one time i was running out on the streets one day i think after work and i was just like a, you know weird thought just popped in my head like what are you doing where are you running from like just a little thought in my head and i guess of course that's kind of you know the resistance or whatever it may be but it, it did come during a time where I was just running month after month, just like, just, just pounding out the miles. And essentially what I got down to thinking was that, ah, what I'm not doing is I'm doing that thing that people don't do is that when you run often, you should always schedule a race, whether it's a race every month or a race every week, just to give you something to aim for, just to keep, and then also to keep you disciplined because I always, because I felt, especially towards the end, I was kind of, you know, slacking off a bit because I didn't really have a goal of what I was doing. I was just running for the sake of running, right? I didn't really have anything that I was getting into. And I think that kind of correlated with just when I was starting to kind of, you know, get popping in the whole Dawson scene and become a little bit more popular in that little social circle. So the need to run, the need to be doing those things was kind of waning and then the kind of social life was kind of increasing again, which is, you know, back to where I was kind of come from now and the things I'm trying to correct. So having those races is super, super important in terms of like keeping you focused, I think. <sighs> And just get back to this. Let's get back to Dykes. Oh, what's up to Dykes? No. Wife and I, wife and I retired. I, I run so little each week. Of course, a month ago, I, I hit a 230 mile week. Uh, that was all just one race. This guy is awesome. I love him already, man. He's my friend. I love this. I love Dykes. Dykes loves competitive side around. He hired a coach five years ago. Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, obviously, I'm getting old. If I want to get a new PR, I'll have to take a chance. He's trying to get a new PR at 75 years old. 70 years old. Mama mia. Dykes knocked 35 minutes off his marathon time. Wow. Wow. Congratulations, Dykes. You fucking legend. I need to start running without headphones, too. I think that's what I'm missing out on. He's got good form, too, isn't it? Look at his form as he's running. Knees and arms and shoulders, hips look amazing. The condition he must be in is fucking incredible to run that much at that age. Um, again, yeah, I think I'm, I need to get into running without headphones too. That's my kind of limiting factor at the moment. 
I'm quite disciplined in that. I'm quite good. I'm a lot better than some people. I'll just have what I want. I'll just have what I want to listen to playing, and I won't skip it or miss it again. I won't mess around with stuff I'm gonna play unless I'm hitting basically the last mile. I might want to put on like Playboy Carti, R.I.P. That's my my go-to kind of like ramp up song. But for the most part, I just stick to what is on my ears. But um, what's in my ears for the sake of it. But um, yeah, there might be something about running with my headphones that might actually help me going forward. This guy's awesome, isn't it? Thanks, otherwise simplifies his training. I don't do cross training, stretching, special diets, none of that stuff. Just I run. Tell people I just run. Yeah, there is there there is something uh, simple about that, isn't it? I remember a lot of people saying the same sort of thing, like you know, just run. All those other training bits are all important and really cool and stuff, whatever. That, but the only way to get better at running is guess what? Running. Can't start till the GPS start. Miles don't count. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Keep myself right on pace. I set three marathon PRs last year. Wow. Five years ago, I would never have believed such a thing could happen. Wow. Dash broke free, free, the free hour barrier multiple times, right? That's what I said. Multiple times, what did I say? Dash broke the free hour mar the free hours multiple times. Jesus Christ, 2018. That's amazing. It was three times to be exact. Jesus Christ. He finished one in a PR of two hours, 54 minutes. The time was an unofficial world record. Wow. For someone that old, I'm assuming. The late Ed Whitlock holds the most seven plus age records. Even if I were to get my Jacksonville Marathon time uh, ratified as a world record, it would still be Ed Whitlock 35, Gene Dykes 1. <laughs> He's more proud of another accomplishment. I did a 200 mile race. August, September, and October. Two wow. It's another part of my just run philosophy. Wow. Did I know whether or not I could actually run 200 miles month after month after month. Uh, who knows? But you never know unless you try. If it gets to the point where I can't beat times anymore, I have my own personal metric that I keep for the trail runs, which is the oldest known finisher. And I have five or six, seven races now where uh, nobody older has ever finished the race. Of course, as I get older, that gets easier. My ultimate goal is to win the 120 age group in Boston somewhere. Wow. That is so cool, man. Again, so inspiring. And I guess when, 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 you, when you're in a funk that, like I was a couple of days ago or just, you know, whatever it may be, just in general life, watching those kind of things put stuff into perspective, you know, just how long life is how much time there is to do the things that you want to do. There's no rush. Life essentially is a marathon. You know, RIP, Nipsey Hussle, long live the great Nipsey. Um, life really is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, take every day as it comes and try and, and basically try and do your best with every day that you have available. Uh, tomorrow isn't promise, all that good stuff. But yeah, this is an amazing story. Gene Dykes, Some Runners World. You can check it out, I'm assuming, on their YouTube channel. It's probably on their Twitter. It's on their Twitter too. That's where I found it. Um... And then the other thing that I thought was super inspiring was this video, again on Twitter, of this absolute psycho, um, psycho known as fucking Mick Jagger, right? Shaking his hip things and doing his fucking thing and trying, I think he's rehearsing or whatever, maybe you're working out. Like, look at this guy. 75 years old. Wow. Wow. So cool, no? Yeah, he's rehearsing. I'm sorry, rehearsing. That is fucking amazing. No? Isn't that fucking amazing how amazing this is? Mick Jagger doing this at 75 years old, rehearsing his whole songs. It's fucking amazing. It's so cool. It's him dancing in front of a mirror, rehearsing a song he's probably going to go do. Wow. So cool, man. So fucking cool. Really, really cool. I guess some people would argue that it maybe is easier for a Mick Jagger because, you know, he's essentially been a performer and entertainer for, you know, the most of his life. So he no he doesn't know anything other than what he's doing right now. But there is, again, something really admirable about being getting to that age and still, still trying to hustle, still trying to do your thing. You don't need to, man. You're Mick Jagger, man. You could probably hire some kids to dance in front of you and still create a vibe. You could probably do it sitting down and people still, you know, buy your tickets for another reunion tour of you like it's not really that much of an important thing but you know for him personally i guess it's something that he wants to do and you know he's doing it he's fucking doing it 
Um, and in the last video, I want to show you on my Twitter feed before we get into all the streetwear news because today's streetwear Thursday, as you can see from what I'm wearing, is this awesome video about um, Jeff Koons' rabbit piece, um, art piece, the still rabbit selling on Christie's. I think it's the, light, it's, the, it's the most expensive piece of modern art sold, I think, nowadays. I think 54 million signed out sold the news, but let's watch the video and then we can find out exactly what the details are. Let's get onto it now. Make that big there. Press that so you can see that and then let's get it on. When it was first shown and so on, but in 1986, it was a, it was, there was a big stir about it. The opinions would vary from like horrible to amazing. Wow. Of, uh, famously said, the former director of the Museum of Modern That's so said, cool. He was dumbstruck when he saw it for the first time. And he called it an alien that landed, but it's spot on. And that's what many people see in this. It was really so out there when he did it. And it also stands for as one of the most important sculptures of the second half of the century, uh, the 20th century. Wow. It is for me the antithesis to, uh, to, to the David. It's the anti-David. Granted, it's not a young, fantastic uh, man, but it is just an inflatable bunny uh, cast out of stainless steel that stands, stands there in eternity, wow. meant to float everywhere, but it's too heavy and would sink everything. Between Marilyn, his most famous woman, and Elvis, his most famous man, he chose the subject where he wanted to depict just a hero of his time who he thought would have longevity, and as we know, he, do he does, and he did, because Elvis is still, uh, no matter how old you are, you know who Elvis Presley was. In a funny way, you can make the parallel to what the Marilyn is for Andy Warhol, JFK is for Rauschenberg. So this image, this very famous image that was ta taken from a Buffalo speech where he's pointing his fingers, uh, other important icons of the 60s, uh, you see the moon landing in the bottom left corner, you see... Uh, Did I miss a bit of Christie's with Jordan a bit of Jeff Koons? Why are they going on about Rauschenberg? Okay, anyway, I'll, I'll find another video of it. But yeah, it's, it's sold for, I think it sold for about 54 million just the other day at Christie's. I think it might be the most expensive artwork sold so far. I'm pretty sure, which is absolutely insane, isn't it? Jeff Koons is alive and well and absolutely doing a damn thing. But I think those those sculptures are really impressive to see in real life. I think sometimes you get a bit desensitized from those kind of things by seeing it on the internet, but seeing them in real life really does add um, a different element to it all, all, all over again. Um, okay, yeah. So here's the uh, here's the piece here on um, yeah, exactly. I'm pretty sure this was the one on BBC News. Let's get this up on here. Jeff Koons' rabbit sculpture breaks the record for living artist. Like amazing, and to think this this is what this sort of thing is selling for that much. But it must imagine how cool that would look like in one of these one of those new amazing apartments that you see on the Zine. Or something that's so cool it's actually pretty big as well and it? it's a lot bigger than i thought it would be um a sculpture by u.s pop artist jeff Koons has sold for 91 million dollars 71 million pounds sorry my bad breaking the record price for a work by a living artist the christie's in new york sold the rabbit a uh, 140 centimeter steel cast of an inflatable rabbit in 1986 for more than 20 million over its estimated price it beats the previous record set by british artist david hockney oh david hockney was up there okay i didn't know that the buyer has in, was in the audience but was not been named on its website christy described rabbit as a cute sinister cartoonish posing vacuous sexy chilling dazzling and iconic wow loads of words there it's one of the jeff coon's most well-known pieces the u.s artist sculptures um have provoked controversy for decades after he emerged as a leading figure in new york city of course this um, provocative. Let's see what the guide is to Jeff Koons here. A guide to Jeff Koons. So the thing about Jeff Koons is he's, he's obsessed with art history. So all his art is referring back to some art historical movement or another, or loads. And I, when I say referring back, I mean like really referring back mm. to 30,000 years ago. Wow. So if you look at his big pinky purple Venus balloon sculpture, which is made out of steel, which is huge. What is it? I think like that. That is a direct reference to a tiny figurine called the Venus of Willendorf, which was found in 1908 and thought to be one of the first artworks made wow. by man. Wasn't he also inspired by his personal life? He did famously marry an Italian porn star who also was uh, an Italian politician. He got divorced eventually, but they had a child. But he did make a whole series of artworks around that relationship called Made in Heaven, which is <laughs> graphically pornographic culture and stuff which is considered to be vulgar uh, it's interesting that they say that jeff Koons' inspiration is really inspired by you know essentially some of the greatest works of art but he gets completely pillared 
right? It gets really, really wrecked on so, um, from, you know, art critics are, are, are brought um, wide and far. But I guess because it's not, you know, it's maybe the, from terms, from a visual aspect, it maybe just looks like the lowest common denominator, right? It's something that most people will be into. And I guess most art critics aren't really into that kind of things. They want things that are going to push the envelope, things that are a bit thought-provoking, things that are super, um, a little bit uncomfortable to look at. Because if you look at the stuff that he did previously when he was dating the, or when he was married to the porn, uh, the Italian porn artist, what's her name? Ticolino, Checo, however you pronounce her name. Um, that that work was really, really, really edgy, right? It's, it's, it's something that you expect somebody of that age at that at that place and time with the amount of fame and wealth that he had with those two worlds combining so that's the kind of work you expect right but now he's you know i'm assuming in his 50s or something he's a you know an older dude with an actual business with a team full of assistants with studios all over the world the work that he's making now is a is ref, more refined and maybe a little bit more with a little bit more intention towards it right it's not just like slapping everything out there and just trying to get out there for the sake of it but it's also a part of him that's also maybe uh, democratic he wants to have as many people in as many people who aren't art fans come by the gallery see his work of art and be inspired uh be um have some kind of emotion that makes them makes life worth living that kind of an emotion that can take them through for their working day whatever it may be i think that's quite an inspiring place to be as an artist right where you can kind of touch the contemporary art fans you can touch the art students and you could also touch the general average uh, you know everyday person walking on the street you could be like oh that's really impressive is that is that a balloon oh no you touch it wow sick it's still obviously you're not going to get to touch the jeff coon's artwork but still the idea that you know that this guy is essentially making these inflatable sculptures that look like they're inflatable but they're essentially made out of steel aluminium loads of other kind of metals it's freaking fucking incredible i think and, and unacceptable is just turning it into art. But he became really famous for this huge puppy wow. which is made of flowers, or it's made of lots of things, so it cool. like it was made of flowers. And then he's also very famous for making these big balloon-like sculptures, like a, you know, like a kid's entertainer. So cool. And they make a balloon puppy or a balloon swan. Well, Jeff Koons was doing just that, except his balloon puppy and his balloon swan was made out of stainless steel, wow. and they were huge. It's all made with this super shiny stainless steel. Mm. So he argues that he makes these uh, surfaces so spectacularly beautiful and brilliant and faultless, not for himself, but for you. Exactly. Nice. How much would it cost me? It would cost you a fortune, Phoebe. You <laughs> can't afford it. You work for the BBC. <laughs> balloon dog sold for well, well over fifty million dollars at the time. That's a bargain, isn't it? Fifty-eight, fifty-eight million dollars now, considering what that rabbit went for. That's a fucking bargain, and that and that dog looks like a, looks a lot bigger than a rabbit. I'm not sure if the prices for his artworks or his sculptures go by size, um, coloration, uh, finish. I'm assuming they all finish to the same sort of standard. I'd assume so. Um, but yeah, 58 million in terms of buying a dog, in terms of the rabbit, would be super worth it. You could resell that really good. Maybe at Flight Club. <laughs> the most expensive and artwork is sold at auction made by a living artist since superseded by David Hockney recently. But you could buy like one of his limited edition Louis Vuitton handbags. Awesome. Maybe that's uh, the way of doing it. Good tip. Thanks. What are your favourites then? The works I love of his the most actually are the early works. It's the work beginning with E. I see it's huge E. I, that's the word. Wow. I mean. That's awesome. Him floating a basketball in a tank of water. And it kind of looks like a fetus as well. So I thought they they were great. And he also did some really fantastic stuff with um, Hoovers. Yeah, I love the Hoover one. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, seeing the Hoovers. Hoover. Yeah, I saw that one. He these old Hoovers. So cool. And And that was sort of harking back to the min minimalism of the 1960s. Yeah, that's super cool. Like I like Morris that. And Dan Flavin, except he was really into the Hoovers and into the Hoovers for two reasons. Once, when he was a kid, he was a door-to-door -door salesman. As a child, he'd go around selling sweet wrappers. In fact, uh, Hoovers were still sold door-to-door, -door, so he sort of saw that connection. But they started running out of the Hoovers he wanted. He takes, starts taking these huge bus rides around America so he can buy the specific Hoovers he wants to show in his exhibition. So That's so cool. That's so cool. Jeff Koons is definitely an artist of the time. So, so to say Knut Koons is irrelevant or silly, I think is, is unfair. He's somebody people like to pick on because the art looks simple. But he would argue that's the whole point, that simplicity is the most difficult thing to achieve. I, and I agree. Simplicity is the most difficult thing to achieve. That's some of the, you know, some of the best design is the design you don't even notice, right? It's sort of like the the you know the doors in a hospital right you you, you automatically know wh which way to pull and push right without even thinking about it that's sim that simplicity of design is what 
that's 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 kind of design that is pinnacle. That's 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 the real, real, real uh, um, apex of design. You have no. It doesn't tell you to pull or push. You just you know you just know instinctively because it, the way it's designed is actually there's only there's only one way it can be done. And I guess maybe in the creative field there is maybe a bit of snobbery towards that kind of way of designing because I don't know because I guess if you're a critic you want to write there's there's nothing there's nothing you can write about there there's nothing you can really flesh out you want something more something meaty uh, to write about but I guess for me as a fan of creative people and as somebody that wants to be creative and get into that field I admire somebody that's able to make a really well put together t-shirt a well put together pair of shorts a really amazing toothbrush a really amazing design beer bottle uh, water bottle a really amazing design backpack a running pouch running shoes and just these small little design details that you don't really pay attention to that really go a long way into making the experience completely faultless so yeah big up jeff coons uh that sculpture is fucking amazing and i guess if you have the money you should probably get that sort of stuff and just have it in your house for sake for the sake of it not even to resell man just for your kids to look at something inspiring and think you know what some human somewhere did that right and if i can apply some level of creativity to whatever i'm doing how far could i get in life how far um let's get into some topics i have here listed ba, ba, ba. five tips to get ahead at work five tips to get ahead at work another article from the bbc i haven't watched this actually so i'm going to watch this directly with you guys and we're going to break this down and see what they're talking about see if there's any facts or if there's any um, made up shit to do with this because again i really say you know i mentioned quite a lot on here i fucking detest having to work but i do love to work because it allows me the ability to do the thing that i love to do which is stuff like this but there's also i'm also very aware of the things that you have to do at work in order to maintain a good relationship with your colleagues with your soon senior supervisors with your managers and with the people that work around you you know there's things that you have to do little 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 kind of you know trinkets like you know going out for lunch sometimes and be hanging out with them for a beer little things you have to do in order to make sure that you have good harmony with your colleagues so let's see what bbc say about this and let's see if we can um, add on to any of the things that we're talking about here do, 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 do. <laughs> Oh, is this sort of like one of those women? Oh, it's a women thing. Okay, women. Okay, so so okay, so it's about women mostly. But let's see if we can get anything from it. Now work all over the world. Here I'm going to talk about five of those behaviors that most commonly get in women's ways. The first behavior is a reluctance to claim your achievements, expecting others to spontaneously notice and reward your contributions and your hard work. Um, I wouldn't say that specifically. I wouldn't say the the inability to um speak up to the things that you've done is necessarily a woman thing. I think I think that's for most people. Most people are quite, especially British people, we're quite shy. Americans are different. I, I think I've told this story a few times, but I'll tell it on here. But when I first went to New York for my first kind of boys trip, which was maybe early two thousands, maybe two thousand two, two thousand three, maybe around then. Um, went to New York for my first kind of, you know, boys trip that you do with all your friends and shit. It was like 15 of us, like it's a completely crazy, insane journey. But one thing I remember taking back from it was that American confidence, right? That American ego that we don't have here. We're a bit more, we're a bit proper. We're a little bit, um, we're, we're polite. Um, we're very reserved and all that shit. But America is the complete opposite of us, right? Very, very bombastic, very loud and in your face in a good way. And also very proud of the stuff they've done. So whenever we'd go to like a sceney kind of event, I think we went to like a 10 deep party. We went to some other kind of, uh, some other gallery stuff. But the stuff that we go to here in the UK, right? You go to an art exhibition, you go to a store release party for a capture collection they're doing, you know, the standard streetwear culture sort of stuff. We went to one and one, one, one thing I re remember was a random guy or girl instantly within five minutes of me meeting them or talking to them, giving me their pitch, right? I am so-and-so, I'm from this place, I'm currently doing this, I have an agency, I have a brand, I currently sing, I'm a DJ, what do you do? Quickly looking to see who can, and not in a kind of douchey LA way where they want to extract value, but more so as in like, this is what I can do. If you've got something for me and I could, that you want me to do, let me know, here's my card. As in the LA way, it's a bit more like, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, right? In LA, if, if, you, if, if the person comes up to you and tells you they're a comedian and you have nothing to do in the entertainment industry, they're going to quickly find a way to kind of get out of the conversation. In New York, they're just going to tell you what they do so that in the hope that you can kind of put them on. And we don't do that here in the UK, which kind of leads back into work, right? If, you don't, if, if, if you're not able, like, how many of your friends do you not know that they have 
they do something on the side, whether it's DJing, whether it's doing comedy, whether it's, I don't know, fencing, whether it's running. You have no idea because they don't necessarily bring it up because they're a bit shy of bringing it up. And then the people, think about it, people in your workplace who are very quick to tell you what they do and what they're getting up to on the weekend or things they do outside of work. What do you think of them, honestly? You think they're a bit of wankers, right? You think they're a bit of a wanker, they're a bit full of themselves. It's not just not a British thing to do. So I think in the UK, by and large, it's not just a women thing. I think when it comes to the workplace, especially if you're working in a big team, especially if it's a big creative team, it's spaces I've worked in in terms of marketing and stuff like that, it's very difficult to put your hand up and say you did what you did and what you brought to the table because things are moving so fast and it's, it's a quote-unquote collaborative workplace. And kind of like at the end of the day, you know, the person's going to take the 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 victory or the credit is going to be the you know the main head, the main marketing manager, the main leader of your group. And obviously, if you guys do a successful campaign as a team, you'll take collective responsibility. You take collective praise for it. But I guess when you move on to the next place or your next job, that's where it's really important for you to claim the work that you did and say, no, I was really instrumental in making up the name, in positioning us with this brand, in um, thinking about this strategic approach, in doing the communication that way. That's why you have to be really, um, um, really, really gung-ho about it. And maybe, for another extent, if you want to get ahead at the workplace you're currently working in, it's also important to maybe just note down what you did um, as you're going through it. Because I think I've done, I've kind of had the thing of, no, I don't I remember what I did. No, you don't. You When time goes by, you won't remember jack shit. So as you're doing projects or as you're doing campaigns, maybe have a notepad that you're just jotting down what is actually your con- what you contributed to the thing, um, whether it's um, creating a deck, whether it's helping out with the presentation, whether it's um, calling a prospective clients or partnership people. Write down what you've done. So then when it comes to negotiating your pay later on, because I'm assuming that's what this whole video is about, you have something to kind of reference back to. What are you paying attention to? And what I often hear is, I'm not good at that at all. And when I ask them, why aren't you good? I hear one of two responses. The first is, I would think that if I do good work, people should notice. They probably should, but I don't think it's going to happen in today's workplace. The other thing I hear... That doesn't happen also in kind of creative fields, right? People, I hear people say that often, even in sports. I don't worry, they'll find you if you're good enough. No. Nah. That's there's part of that is true. Like, I guess if you're let's let's go into athletics. If you're a, or sports, if you're like a, a really talented footballer that's actually smashing it in the men's Saturday league, there will come a time where somebody will eventually see that oh, this kid's like way better than everyone that's on this pitch, right? That plays it every week. This guy needs to needs to get signed up. But you have to put yourself in a position for people to see you. You have to go to these matches. You have to go to these games. You have to sign yourself up, pay your subs. You know, you have to kind of be be out there. And this idea that you can kind of just do it from the distance is like. It's a little bit naive, I think, in my experience. In my experience, anyway. Here is, if I have to act like that obnoxious jerk down the hall to get noticed, I'd rather not get noticed. And that's problematic because it behaves in either or way of thinking exactly. that is going to get in your way. If you set yourself up, either you're obnoxious and constantly talking about yourself, or you just hang back and hope others notice, you've got a kind of no-win place to be. And am I, am I the only person I guess that's actually a bit impressed, I guess a little bit jealous when you meet people that are super obnoxious and really self-absorbed? There's a part of me that wants to have a little bit of that self-confidence, especially when you meet somebody. We've all done it. We've all met somebody in our lives who's obnoxious, self-absorbed, and in your eyes, they have no reason to be, right? They're obnoxious and self-absorbed about really limited things, right? They're extremely limited in their talent and extremely limited in their ability to do a particular job. They're just extremely limited. And you're like, how the fuck are you so self-confident of yourself and you're not having anything to back it up? But then I get, whenever I think that, it's all making switches into like, wow, man, I'm envious of that. I wish I could have that kind of, um, if, I wish I could look at myself that way. And I guess for the most creative people, for the people that are most, um, who probably have the most potential, there is part of you that is quite self-loathing in general. But I also think it's quite dangerous, as this lady's pointed out. You have to take bits of that obnoxiousness, bits of that self-absorbed person and apply it to your life and have those kind of character traits in you. Because again, if you don't talk highly of yourself, if you're not out there promoting yourself, nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody. That's a stonewall guarantee. For example, you might identify, you know, I think that my boss doesn't really understand how well-connected I am in this organization. So I think what I'm going to do is once a week, I'm going to shoot him a quick email that just summarizes the main people that I've managed to talk to that week. I have seen this be remarkably successful for women. Really? That sounds like shit advice. The second behavior is the disease to please. That is hoping and wanting.
wanting everyone to think you are a wonderful and always nice person. Now, this is a typical behavior that can be very helpful early in your career, but can really get in your way as you seek to rise. Why is that true? First of all, if you're always seeking to please, you're going to have a hard time holding other people accountable true. for showing up for what they promised because you're going to be afraid that maybe they won't like you. And I can attest to this, right? Um, that to please, I think I started a bit skeptical, but I can attest to that. When I was working in a retail store and I managed to work my way up to be a supervisor and kind of help out the management team, which, you know, I probably know had, had no right to do, but they probably saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, which is fucking amazing. The issue that I had as well at that time, especially because I was managing the same group of people that I was working with on a part-time and a full-time basis, I didn't create that distance. And the mistake that I made, I remember my manager actually telling me, I'm going to move you to another store so you can manage that store, right? And I was like, no, no, no I want to stay here. And I and I think what that person meant was that if I would go to the other store, I'd get more experience working there as an actual manager because the people there don't know me. That then I could then come back later to that store and I could, you know, I could I could have a it, it's a different person entering the door. But when you go from being a part timer to full timer to suddenly being part of the management, it's hard to kind of break that break that bond that kind of you know because you're not you're not friends like that anymore in the workplace. I'm now the superior. You have to, I'm you you're accountable to me. I'm accountable to you to some extent. But, you know, there's that weird kind of hierarchy there. And obviously, when you're working a part time or working full time, you want to please everyone. Right. You want to get on everyone because you want to get invited to stuff. You want to be in the gossip. You want to go to lunch with people. You want to, you know, you just want to you, you want to please people and stuff. You just want to be a, a good colleague. But then when you get into management, you can't necessarily do that because, you know, if everyone likes you, they, everyone will, will probably won't respect you. That's the thing you love quite quickly. And um, respect is something that is very hard to gain, but really easy to lose. And you don't want to get into that position either. So I think even, especially in the beginning of your career, especially if you're interning or you're beginning as an assistant or whatever you may be doing, just being a people pleaser, just being nice to hang around if is a bonus because for the most part, you know, especially if you're interning in places, if everyone's most really experienced, and I guess there will be people in there that are really hard to work with and pains in the asses. So you'll be quite a breath of fresh air to coming in about optimistic and nice and fresh and stuff. But once you work your way up the ranks and you start, you know, getting some seniority, start getting some responsibility, start taking some... Um, yeah, it's also like it's a responsibility in, in budgets and all that stuff and meetings and plans and stuff. You have to kind of, you have to break away from that people-pleasing thing and just get back to doing the job and, and actually um, leading by example in that regard. And it's really hard to do, honestly. I don't envy it whatsoever. It's probably the hardest part of any kind of job, that kind of leadership element. And it's a part of the job that people don't really understand when they're working in places. They're kind of usually like, oh, the manager doesn't do anything. What he's doing just sitting on his laptop. But honestly, that stress of having to deal with people, you know, essentially you're, a, you know, you're putting out fires every single day. You're the first line defender. Something goes wrong with somebody's life or work. It's very, very stressful. I would say in that regard. You're going to have a hard time saying no to things and end up saying yes too often. Mm -hmm. And you're going to let people who will take advantage violate your own boundaries and waste a lot of time. I'm not saying here that you don't want to be a wonderful person, but being invested in everyone thinking you're wonderful and nice is, if you seek to rise, going to get in your way. It's great. If you can start small, again, by asserting boundaries in one way, say to yourself, right now I'm overcommitted, so that in the next month, when people ask me to join a new task force or something else, I'm going to think about it very deliberately before I say yes. Awesome, and awesome. I'm not only going to think about how would it please them, but I'm going to think about how might it serve me? Is this really in my best interests? That's a really good tip. But anyway, there's, there's loads on there. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It's going to be to sit down, but I'll link it in the show notes for you to check it out. It's um, I, I, don't, I think it's five habits that hold women back at work. Um, so, but I guess you can apply it to all people, to all um, sexists, not specifically for women. I think these are things that we all kind of suffer from in the workplace. You know, it's a kind of a testing environment. Um, but I really recommend you check it out. Some really good advice there. Some problems and then some actionable steps you can take towards it. Really nice bite-sized info from the BBC once again. So check that out. Um, what else is on this list here? Ba, 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 ba. Let's see. Get this list up on here. 
Um, Uber quiet mode. This is fucking awesome, right? Something I've been thinking about for a while and something that I've also thought... Because I had this idea, right, for Uber that I thought would be quite cool, but obviously it's not going to be cool because I guess it's my idea. And if and if I'm not working in Uber, then it's probably not the best idea because they probably have the smartest people in the world working for that company. But I had this idea uh, that struck me when I was... Um, this is before I had this good phone, right? My other phone was a bit shit, smashed up and a bit, you know, a bit, um, it ran, it ran its course for, for lack of a better term. And it kind of, you know, it wasn't charging and all that sort of good stuff. But when I had my phone, it was fucked up. I would always be like, you know, out and about, usually late at night, partying somewhere. And my phone, you know, would run out of battery and I couldn't get home on time because I couldn't get my Uber. And I was thinking to myself, you know, it would be amazing if there was an option, if Uber had a um, big kiosk, right? Like a massive screen, you know, like those, um, uh, kind of bus stop billboard sort of things. They're like a really flat, massive screen and they're just on the side of the streets and that's got an advert in it and they usually put um, posters inside of them. Imagine if you could get a big screen like that, similar to what you'd get in, an, in a McDonald's, right? A massive screen where you order your food, an Uber one. So essentially you could go on there, you could log into your account and then um, when you log into your account, you could log into your account on there and you could order an Uber to that exact um, taxi rank. So there could be Pacific taxi ranks in and around Oxford Circus or in around a particular metropolitan area, Soho, Dawson, Shoreditch, and it will pick up and drop, it will pick people up from that exact location and take you home. So you can actually get home if your battery, if your phone battery ran out. And I thought that would be quite a cool idea in that respect, right? But again, maybe it's not that cool of an idea. But then the other idea that I thought would be really cool, if there was an option that allowed you to uh, flick a little button or a, a tick or a little switch on your little account once you request an Uber, that allowed it for the Uber driver not to speak to you. Because I think there was a time, I remember, I don't know when it was, maybe it was because of the Uber strike and stuff and maybe the drivers won't get that many clients. I don't know what it was, but it seemed like every other Uber I went into, the, the driver that I was, um, that was driving me to my destination was extremely chatty, right? To the point of like, you know, there is the, 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 there's a chatty where like they start off chatting to you and then they realize, okay, cool, this guy doesn't want to chat and they shut the fuck up. But the chatty where it's like, you know, the person, I don't know, maybe they just want to have a chat. So they're just going on and on and on about something without you giving them any encouragement. They're just talking, talking, talking. It's like, oh, the last thing you want to do is like get in, especially if you're going, especially I'm the kind of person where if I'm DJing somewhere, I don't play my head, I don't play any music in my ears because I know I'm going to be listening to fucking music for, you know, four hours and when I'm going to DJing in a bar. And when I'm going to go meet friends up for some drinks or to go hang out, the last thing I want to do is talk to somebody in an Uber because I'm going to be talking for fucking, you know, four and a half hours when I'm out with my friends. So I just want silence. I just want to be on my phone. Just looking out a window. I just want one side. I won't even put music onto onto the, on the guy's speakers. I'll I'll just let him play whatever radio he's playing. Just chill. So um, I thought that'd be a quite a good mode, but I didn't know whether it would be rude for the driver if somebody I didn't want to like, whatever it may be. But I thought for Uber it would be really good because they could easily, if they wanted to, they could easily just charge extra for that mode, right? And say, look, if you want a quiet mode, it's going to be an extra charge on top, like three fifty dollars, three fifty pounds. I don't know whatever it may be, but I think a lot of people would kind of budget for it. And then now this news comes out that um, Uber and uh, Uber is launching the quiet mode um, for Uber Black service. I think that's the service where you get the limos, right, the or the luxury cars. So they, I think they're testing it out on this level, and then probably going to iterate it out for um most of the uh classes of cars you want to get like uber x and whatever it may be so the, uh, it says the following this is an article from TechCrunch. um tired of chatty drivers uber is finally giving users its most requested feature and in that i didn't know this is most requested that's even awesome and in that way to ask for a minimal and also i thought this would be the same thing like for you know, sometimes when you get into an Uber and people are super anxious about making sure the guy's got an auxiliary cable he's got a charger um, I don't know, whatever it may be. So that might be a cool way to do it, right? Where you go and request an Uber and you can check off some sections. Like like you do when you go and order a McDonald's or a burger or whatever. You can say, I don't want any pickles or whatever. You can maybe check off a box and say, um, I want an Uber that has a USB cable, an Uber that has, um, uh, I don't know, an auxiliary thing. And then when it scans the area for local, um, for guys that are ready to pick you up, they'll, if they have those things, they can pick you up. If they don't, they can't. And if it takes longer, it does, but at least you know when you get in there, you have those things instead of like, oh, you've got this, you've got that, got that, and you don't have it. But anyway, let's go on. And in that way to ask for the minimal conversation during your ride. The quiet mode feature is free and will be available to everyone in the US tomorrow, but only on Uber Black and Uber Black SUV Premium users. Um, users, users can select quiet, preferred, happy to chat, or leave this, the setting on no preference. The desire for silence might convince more riders to pay for Uber's more expensive vehicle tires so they can work, nap, or take a call, just relax. Okay, that's cool. That's a very good way to kind of get people to go into because that's the most um, expensive option. It's got it here on the thing. 
ride preference on the screen. The desk quite awesome. Quiet mode comes as part of a new slate of rider preferences, features that users um, can set up before they hail an Uber Black or SUV, but not while waiting for the ride or while in the car. A bags option lets users signal that they have bags. Yes, it's awesome too. That's a fucking awesome because I always forget. Especially when I'm going to the airport, I'll just Uber and I'll just order an Uber, normal Uber, and then you know when you get to by the time it comes, it's like maybe some small Toyota Prius, and maybe the boot isn't that big, and the guy's like, "Oh fucking hell!" So you forget to order like an Uber XL or whatever, maybe so you can put. Or especially if you've got loads of people with you, you know, there's certain things you just forget to do on the thing. But I think that's a really cool option there. Um, and plus, I've been doing it quite often going to the airport because I live near Stanford Airport, and I usually get a coach in the morning because I usually get that really god awful Ryanair flight at six a.m. in the morning. But nowadays, I'll just I prefer to get an Uber for forty quid. It's you know it picks you up in front of your house. You get there in like I don't know half an hour, um, and it's really it's a calm ride all the way through, right? Uh, the temperature control lets them request the car to be warm or cold, so drivers know whether to crank the air conditioning on. Uber black drivers are now supposed to wait fifteen minutes after arriving arriving before cancelling on you, as it's standard with private car services. Though you'll start to be charged as they'll and they'll be compensated after five minutes. Plus, they technically can cancel whenever they want. Uber Black Riders will get premium phone support like members of Uber Rewards Highest Diamond Tier. And Uber is going to require nicer and newer cars for future drivers signing up for Uber Black with centralized rules within written at Uber HQ instead of local branches. Yeah, the following. We're looking to create more differentiation between the premium products and the regular products to encourage more trips. Uber product manager A. Aiden Gaja tells me quiet mode in, in particular is something that people have been asking for for a long time and the talkative drivers have been a subject of plenty of comedy sketches. <laughs> I think quiet mode is going to be a hit perhaps because I requested that Uber uh, build a quiet mode in my December product wish list after testing it last July. The feedback I received from many male readers uh, was that there was a worse things that have to be chatting to an Uber driver and that's rude to dehumanize them to man silent but that ignores the fact that women often feel uncomfortable when male drivers increasingly incessantly talk to them and it can get scary when it turns into an unwanted flirtation considering the driver is in control which is very true I think yeah guys usually don't really give a shit I think we have loads of non-verbal clues non-verbal cues that can kind of stop the conversation but I guess the dynamic between a guy and a girl especially if the not, 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 not that it's any excuse but especially if the girl's attractive must be a bit weird right when a dude that's like you know again he's he's been taking 25 dudes and then one attractive girl rocks up to his car um and she starts giggling or has a conversation back that in his head that might be an indication that he should carry on flirting when really she's just being friendly so i guess in terms of making sure there's no awkward moments or whatever just put quiet mode in and everyone kind of is safe in that regard um the, 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 in many cases, riders may feel um, rude or frightened to reject conversation and ask out loud for quiet. That's why I hope Uber plans to expand the Uber, to Uber, UberX as well as the international markets, though the company had nothing to share on that. But obviously, they're going to do that. It's standard um, practice in startups. You know, start small in the area that you kind of are familiar with and then kind of expand it as it kind of goes on. And also to drum a bit of interest as well. Um, Uber's uh, Gaja, the guy, um, sorry, the product dude says, did reveal that it was the reaction of Uber black drivers was overwhelmingly positive because they want to deliver a great experience of course but they don't necessarily know that the rider wants um these guys take a lot of pride in what they do as customer service agents i assume so because these are like the people that would uh necessarily lend or do uh driving for like a luxury car service so then now they're going over to uber and uber is usually kind of a bit of a cowboy land so the way they differentiate themselves between those guys is by providing really good service, but they don't know what good service is if they don't have those options. Because I'm assuming Addison Lee and other private car hire services have those kind of options listed, right? What kind of car you want, what kind of brand, even maybe the, the look of the dude and all that stuff is probably important. So Uber going this direction is probably a good way. And again, I just think it's going to broaden it up to everyone, I think most people would want to use that option just because they want quiet, especially the people that like working whilst they're in an Uber or, you know, conducting phone calls and all that shit. Um, the, the, the Uber did extensive research um, to, on driver's perception in the three months it took to develop the feature, but due to employment laws, it cannot, it can't actually require that drivers abide by user requests for quiet, though they might get negative ratings if they ignore them. Um, um, he insists it's not mandatory the driver is independent contractor. We're just communicating the rider's preference. The rider can have that information and do with it what they want. Given the premium riders often cost two times more the Uber X prices and over three times the Uber pool prices, Uber could make a lot of money encouraging upgrades. That's crucial at a time when the desperate is desperate to improve the margins and shrinks its losses after a weak IPO um, last week saw its new share prices dip. 
With so many competing rideshare services around the world, Uber is wise to take its differential to customer service instead of just costly efforts to win more cars, um, lower prices, and sharpen algorithms. Which is interesting, right? Uber's turned into like, especially if you go abroad, Southeast Asia, and other countries in Europe, Uber's popular, but not as maybe popular as it maybe it is in the UK and maybe the United States. The United States kind of has a bit of a split market share with Lyft in certain places, but it seems like Uber is just used as a term to describe uh, a, um, a, a ride sharing um, application, right? A platform. It's not necessarily just designated to Uber. When you go to other, you know, especially when we went to Bali and shit, there were there was a service there that you use that was, you know, they build it. Oh yeah, you want to use Uber and this, you know, I was told to you download this app. Um, which wasn't Uber, of course, it was their whatever local thing they had to use. But it's interesting that that's become a thing now, right? So I guess what they have to do, if they can't really control those markets outside of the US and maybe the UK and parts of Europe, is make sure that they can differentiate themselves within those markets um, in the UK, in Europe, um, in the North America, and offer a service that no one can actually do. And by offering quiet mode, I think they're going to, it's onto a real big winner. I, I know for sure for me, I'm a big fan of it. I've kind of gone away from going into an Uber and trying to turn that into a party and having my own music play. I don't, I think that's a bit intrusive in my regard. I just want quiet and peace of mind. So um, having that option will be super cool. But yeah, it's going to start in the US and then it's going to roll out, I imagine, international markets very, very soon. <laughs> What else is on the list here? The cost of being 1% of your family, friends, and your life. This is a video that I thought was very interesting. Um, again, it kind of speaks to my entire motivation on things. But this is an interview with a Formula One driver called Nicky Luda, who was, um, I think he was, I think he is, um, he's famous for getting into a really bad accident in Formula One, but he's a legendary Formula One racer. And he had, a, there was a film out that was based on his life and the rivalry with another Formula One driver. I think it was called Heat or something. Is it called? No, Rush. That's it, Rush. So if you might be familiar with him, he's got, um, but yeah, he's a really cool guy, German dude, and speaks very candidly and honestly about his kind of career and why he doesn't have any friends. It's something that's kind of, again, um, something that I've thought about for a long time, I think especially the older you get, especially in the scene, you know, the scene is a weird place where you have this really hyper connectivity for a period of time when you're going out, you 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 know everyone, everyone's your friend, and then it comes to a point where suddenly you don't have that friendship group anymore, and they've, everyone's disappeared, or you've kind of pulled away and gone and done your own thing, and sometimes you can feel like you don't have any friends, but what's actually happened is that those people in the beginning were never actually your friends anyway they were just people that you met during that per that part of your life where you're all trying to figure out who you were as people and you're growing up and you're getting new experiences so you're trying to have as many touch points as you could in life and then suddenly out of that mess you kind of like sprung up and you kind of like went into your own lanes went into your own paths and you started to pursue your own dreams your own whatever if you wanted and naturally, those friends will kind of fall by the wayside, but they weren't necessarily always your friends. And that can be a really disconcerting for people that are really popular in the scene or really popular within something they're doing to suddenly get to a point where you're actually going through some real life shit and you have no one to call. No one that you can really feel comfortable um, being honest with and bearing all your troubles uh, down to it. And Nikki Lauder kind of speaks about it a little bit on this interview here. An in, in, in in-depth interview with, sorry, with um, Graham um, Bensinger, if you listen to it via the podcast app. It's a really cool, he does really cool interviews with loads of uh, iconic sports um, uh, heroes and icons and stuff. So I really recommend you check it out. Really cool interview. Um, but let's play anyway. So I actually wanted to start off by talking to you about uh, your personality. You said you have no friends. This is true. And everybody gets upset about this. The problem is when you get known the world, a lot of people bother you. They want to be your friend because and this and that and this is... Everybody needs something. Correct. And therefore I protected myself against these constant attacks. <clears throat> Somebody says I'm your friend and can you do this and can you do that or I want an autograph or whatever. And to stop all this in a way I protected myself and said where are the real friends? Mm. A real friend is a 24-hour guy who can talk about any kind of problems you have. And I tell you, honestly, I would not know one where I would do that because I protected myself. Your ex-wife. That's very, and again, I think um, that's very true. And I guess it must be even more true if you're like a, a really famous fucking um, Formula One racer Once. dude, right? Um, there is, you know, there is a point in time where, you know, you are, I guess it's, that's the difficult part of being famous or being well-known for something. Um, it's hard to really differentiate between people that you actually are actually there for you for you 
and are there for you because of your star power. And I guess there's nothing wrong with people being attracted to somebody that has influence and has something about them that aura. That's you know, I guess that's how part of human nature. But there must be something nice about being with friends that are actually there for you, who who you are. But the older you get, the more you start to realize that you know friendship is something to be really savored and to be really honored and to be really respected when you do actually have friends and i think sometimes when you're younger you can use that term really flippantly and you can be like you know he's my friend he's my friend because just because you've hanged out and you had a beer or something and the thing the real mark of friendship is that ability to talk to somebody about anything and everything right be real close and feel like you have a kinship that's actual friendship but what you see when you're going what, what you'll see when you're in when you're on your ascension and you're kind of going up into stratosphere and you're becoming famous you're becoming well known you become successful you've got your shit together that isn't friendship that's people being attracted to the things that you're doing and you know the inspiring nature of yourself or you maybe you're motivating maybe they feel as if like they follow your footsteps they can kind of get to where they want to get to but not necessarily friendships and that's something to be differentiated which is why i think it's really important especially if you're doing something and you're trying to get out of where you are get out of where you are where, where you're at or wherever it may be to try and keep that core base of people that have been around you since you were nothing uh close and tight knit and cultivate that relationship whilst you're going up the stratosphere and have a differentiator between your seen friends and your real friends because as we've seen with the james charles stuff like you know everyone and everyone everyone everybody and anybody in that kind of social media circle apart from maybe uh the gabriel zamora guy and maybe nikita dragon are absolutely dragging him no pun intended in on online right no one's really backing him up no one's like you know he might have done something really deplorable he might have been a creep whatever it may be but where are his friends friendship to me is you know sticking by your side thick or thin uh, through the thick or the, through the thick and thin right like being there regardless of what's happening right unless you do something completely heinous and it turns out you're a bloody serial killer or stuff whatever or you've raped like a million people for the most part you should be sticking by them because they're your actual friend right whatever they've done you should be there for them you should be visiting them in prison you should be visiting them on when they hospital, wherever it may be you should be trying to you should try to be putting money towards their court case trying to bail them out that's what friendship is not just being there when i'm launching my makeup kit and I think that's what I've kind of learned, especially in the kind of melee of this whole James Charles drama, is that friendship is something you should savor and not. Be and because you did a video with somebody doesn't mean you're a friend. And the older you get, you start to realize that that friendship is quite rare to find. And apart from maybe your partner and maybe your business partner, the actual partner you live with, whether it's male or female, and your actual business partner who might you know actually be there for you because they want to see the best for you in terms of monetary gain because it helps them too. And outside of maybe your family. <laughs> kind of hard to find friends like that and it really for the most part and again i think it's a really cool in interview i think it kind of comes off a bit you know harsh in the beginning but it's true man it's you know most of us don't really have as many friends as we think we do especially wait until something you know dra tragic no, not wait but if something ha tragic just happened to you touch wood that's when you see where your real friends are and again um they're really really hard to come by but when you do find them hold on tight Anyway, that's it for the Action of English episode number 195. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. I'm going to have another episode later on. That's going to be Street Pacific, all about the streetwear. Today, I just had to rattle off some topics that I kind of had on my list for a while. Um, as always, if you want more information regarding myself, click on my link on the down below in the show description, actionofzinger.com for the information regarding myself. And I'll see you guys again very shortly for another episode of the show. Peace!